The wisest thing you can do to start every day, listen carefully, is to get connected with Almighty God. The wisest thing you can do is make a decision. From this point on, here's how I'm going to begin my day. I'm going to, I'm going to connect before I get out of bed. Lord, I thank you that you have a plan for my life today. I thank you, Lord, that uh, your timing is perfect. I thank you that you'll bring into my life whatever you need to bring. You'll protect me, you'll guide me, you'll lead me. If I go through any kind of suffering and hurt and disappointment and all the rest, I'll trust you to bring me through that. But Lord, I want to thank you that today I'm going to walk obediently before you. I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to do the speaking in me, to give me guidance and direction. And give me your timing. Whatever you have for me, I'm available to wait. I know that waiting will grow me up, strengthen me, prepare me for what you have. I want to thank you for this day. And Lord, let my life be fruitful all day long. You begin the day that way. And all of a sudden, your days on the cloudiest day you've ever seen, sun's going to be brilliant. You know why? Because you are connected with the Father. And he will answer every single prayer that I mentioned in all of that. It's his timing. It's his way. It's his plan. Psalm 31, verses 14 and 15. I trust you, Lord. I trust in you, Lord. You are my God, and my times are in your hands. I would, have you ever prayed a prayer like that? You might want to memorize that verse and pray it every morning. And you get up and go, I trust you, Lord. You're my God. My times are in your hands. What does that mean? God, I got more to do today than I've got time to get done. I have so many appointments. There's no way I'll get it all done. Help me sort it all out. Do what matters most and not worry about the rest. My times are in your hand. I surrender my schedule. I surrender my calendar. I surrender my agenda. My times are in your head. And that means I'm not going to fear. I'm going to trust you. And if I should ask you today, whose schedule do you live by? You'd probably say, well, by my own. And, uh, well, your schedule, what does, where, where is God in all that? Do you ever stop to ask him, Lord, what do you think? What do you want? And when you get up in the morning and you get yourself dressed and you get in your automobile or whatever you do to, to get to work, do you ever stop to ask him what his plan is for the day? Do you ever stop to ask him the question, what would you have me to do here and there? You know what's all laid out before you as far as your job. And when you're off of that job and you head home, do you ever ask God, Lord, what would you have? How would you have me to spend this evening? How do, how do you want to work in my life today? And so often people get up, they get themselves dressed, and they take off and never say anything to God until they get in the traffic, it gets it all bogged down, they can't even see the end of it, and it's already past their time of being to work. And then what happens? First connection. That is not what God intended. His intention was that when you awaken in the morning, you get connected. He said, how do I get connected? You just start talking to him, Father. Thank you for a good night's rest. You know what lies ahead of me today? I want to walk in your timing. I know your timing is best. Don't let me get ahead. Don't let me linger behind. Now let me step out of your will. Let me walk wisely today in your will so that when the day is over, I'll be able to look back and thank you for all that you've done. Every morning when I wake up, I remind myself that I'm on mission 24 seven. But no matter where I am, if I'm in line at the grocery store, if I'm on an airplane, if I'm walking you know, through a mall, I'm on mission for Jesus. We should so live every day that people who meet us, listen, people who meet you should meet Jesus. It doesn't mean you look like him. It doesn't mean any of that, but it means the spirit within you is the spirit of Jesus Christ. Remind yourself every day that God, the creator of the universe, loves you and he has his eye on you and you're the apple of his eye and he's chosen you. When you think about what God has done for you, it's going to bring joy into your life. God loves his children and he wants the best for us. And sometimes that best does not come quickly, but it comes. Now, listen, God is watching over you. God's hand is covering you. 
And if you and I are willing to walk in His way, His will, and His timing, He will provide everything we need and the things that our family needs or our children need. And when we are walking in His will, listen, we are the most recipient at that moment of His plans and that which He has in store for us. Let me ask you a question. Who can do for you what God can do? Nobody. And listen, whatever you're facing in life, think about this. You have Almighty God acting, working sovereignly in your behalf to get you in His will, that you follow Him, and God is good to us. What day in your life is God not working? He keeps your heart beating, but He's also, listen, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. He's the compass. He's the guide. He's the director. He, he's the one who has all the information that you and I need to live a godly life every day and to live it obediently. People say, well, I prayed and asked God to do this and so, and I got a confirmation He was going to do it. And they expect God to do it right then. It may be, listen, it may be that what you've asked Him is right in the center of God's will. But you have to also give Him the privilege to give to you what you've asked for when He knows you're ready. And sometimes you're not ready. I may make specific requests to God and have assurance that He will do it. But then I also have to leave the schedule to Him. When, when God created you, He puts a dream in your heart. Most people start off with a dream, what do they want to do with their life? And they have a vision, a big vision, a big goal. They have uh, you know, some kind of dream or plan or project that they want to do with their life, their, their vision. What's the vision God has given you? Now, I've talked to tens of thousands of people over the years, and I've discovered that while everybody tends to start off early in life with a vision, here's what I'd like to do with my life. Here's what I dream of doing that as life goes on, more and more people give up on the dream before it's accomplished. They give up on the vision, they give up on the goal because it doesn't happen fast enough. Some of you have had your dream battered. Some of you have had your dream bruised. Some of you have had your dream broken. And some of you, out of discouragement and disappointment, have buried your dream. You've given up on it. God doesn't want you to do that. If God gave you that dream for your life, it's going to happen. It just has to happen in His timetable, not in yours. He has a will for your life from the beginning to the end. He knows your past. He knows why you're where you are. And He's willing, listen, He's willing to pick you up right where you are, and He'll give you a whole new beginning. That's what grace is all about. Somebody says, do we have a second chance? Second, third, fourth, fifth. I mean, praise God. He doesn't just cut us off because we missed it somewhere. God has a plan for your life. That plan is fantastic. It's perfect. And it's perfectly suited for you, whoever you are, wherever you are, what's going on in your life. His plan is the best. It brings Him glory and honor and it is fulfilling to you and me. Let me ask you a question. When are you going to start thanking God for the miracle in your life? You know that thing you've always wanted to happen? That prayer you've always been praying, that dream you've always had? When are you going to start thanking God for it? You say, well, after it happens. When you thank God after something happens, that's called gratitude. When you thank God for something before it happens, that's called faith. The highest form of faith is thanking God in advance before you get the answer. But while you make the request, what do you do while you're waiting? You thank God. You say, God, you know that request I made the other day? I thank you that the answer is already on its way. It's not here yet, but I thank you that the answer is already on its way. And you just keep thanking and thanking. That is the highest form of faith.
You don't keep saying, please give it, please give it, please give it, please give it, please give it. You say, God, here's what I need. Now, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That is faith, thanking God in advance. Say thank you in advance for what's already yours. It's how I live my life. That's why I, why I am, one of the reasons why I am today. Say thank you in advance for what is already yours. True desire in the heart for anything good is God's proof to you sent beforehand to indicate that it's yours already. I'll say it again. True desire in the heart, that itch that you have, whatever it is you want to do, that desire, that itch, that's God's proof to you sent beforehand already to indicate that it's yours. Uh, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 11. Anytime you ask for anything in prayer, believe that you have received it and you will receive it. Now I really want you to get this. Notice the change in tense here. Believe that you have received it. That's past tense and you will receive it. That's future tense. You say, wait a minute, I've got to believe I've got it in order to get it? Yep, that's called faith. I believe that I've got it already in order to get it. You're saying, you mean I got to believe a thing is so even though it isn't so, so that it will become so? Yes, that's called faith. We all have dreams and goals that God's placed in our heart, things we're believing for, situations we're praying to turn around. These promises start off like seeds. They don't come to pass overnight. There's always a period of waiting involved. And from the time we pray till the time we see it come to fulfillment, that's called the trial of our faith. This is when many people get discouraged and give up. They start believing the negative thoughts. It's never going to happen. It's taken too long. Now that seed is lying dormant. It's still alive. It still has potential, but you have to do your part and start watering the seed. The way you water it is by thanking God in advance. You can't wait till you receive the promise. You have to thank God that the answer is on the way. Maybe you're struggling in your health. The medical report doesn't look good. Don't talk about how you feel. Say, Father, thank you that I'm healthy. Thank you that I'm strong. Thank you with long life, you're satisfying me. That's not just being positive, that's watering the seed. In your finances, maybe you're struggling. Business is slow all through the day. Father, thank you that whatever I touch prospers and succeeds. Thank you that I'm coming out of debt. Thank you that your favor surrounds me like a shield. When you thank God in advance for the answer, it not only waters the seed, but that strengthens your own faith. So often we think, I'll give God praise after the problem turns around. I'll thank God after business picks up, after I see the solution. Now, if you don't learn this principle to thank God in advance, you won't have the strength you need to wait for the promise. What keeps us strong is getting up in the morning saying, Father, thank you that my dreams are coming to pass. Thank you that this problem's turning around. Thank you that you're bigger than this obstacle. Giving thanks to God removes the anxiety. You can be anxious and worried about anything. You start thanking Him, praising Him, focusing on Him, and it is amazing how the anxiety disappears. Next thing you know, you think, well, you know, what am I worried about? I've got holy, almighty, sovereign God on my side taking care of me. Why am I down in the dumps? Listen, living in the dumps isn't God's plan, and He can get you out real fast. You start thanking Him and praising Him, the devil runs, and God gets you out, and you're rejoicing and praising the Lord before you know it. Because anxiety and fretting over things is not the will of God. We're thanking God before the battle. We're thanking God in advance. That's verbalized faith. Thank you, God, you're taking care of my bankruptcy. Thank you, God, you're taking care of my pain. Thank you, God, you're taking care of this conflict. Thank you, God, and I'm thanking God in advance. Once you pray and ask God to bring the promise to pass, you ask God to heal you, you ask Him to restore a relationship, 
From then on, you don't need to ask God one more time. He heard you the very first time. Now, every time you think about it, you should thank God that the answer is on the way. One time Daniel prayed and asked God to help him. Day after day went by, nothing got better. It looked like that God didn't even hear his prayer. But on the 21st day, an angel showed up and said, Daniel, the first day you prayed, God heard you and dispatched me with the answer. But it took me 21 days to fight through the forces of darkness. What I want you to see is the first day you prayed, God heard you. The first time you asked, God set the miracle into motion. The very first day, the answer was on the way. That's why you don't have to keep praying about the same thing, begging God, asking again and again. The answer is already on the way. The promise is already in motion. The breakthrough is already in route. The right person is already in your future. The victory is already up ahead of you. You prayed about it, now switch over into praise. Start thanking God that is coming. Start thanking Him in advance for the healing, the restoration, the promotion, the vindication, the dream. It's headed your way. You only need to ask God for it one time, but then in all your future prayers, you thank Him. Does that make sense? So you don't have to keep going, please give it to me, please give it to me, please give it to me, please, like you're begging God. No, you just have to say, God, I want you to give this to me. And then for the rest of the time until it arrives, you just thank God. That's faith. Some of you have prayed about the situation long enough. You got to switch over into praise. Get up every morning. Father, thank you that my dreams are coming to pass. Thank you that healing is coming. Thank you that promotion is on its way. That's what's going to keep you strong, not begging, not praying again and again. No, remember, like Daniel, the first day you prayed, God heard it and set the miracle into motion. It's already on the way. As you keep giving God praise, He's going to keep giving you strength to believe. When are you going to start thanking God for that breakthrough in your life? You've wanted it all your life but you haven't been thanking God for it in advance. You've just been begging like you have to bargain or bribe or pressure God to say yes. God wants to say yes. He's waiting for you to show faith. When are you gonna thank God in advance? When are you gonna put the choir before the army in your life? Start with God. Start with God every day. What do you mean? I mean when a new day begins, begin with Him. Just give him some time before you give time to anything else because you are spending time like money every day that you live. So just make sure you spend it on him first. So new day begins, start with Jesus. Because guess what? You are shaped by what you start with. And so if you start with Jesus by reading his word, by talking to him in prayer, you're like, oh, prayer, that's I have every intention of praying, but I try and I don't get it. Maybe you need to get up from your knees and, and walk around. Maybe you need to just take a walk with God. And I'm just telling you, when you begin your day, not with CNN, not with Twitter, not with uh, you know, some fashion magazine, not with a novel, not with a movie, not with a, a quick half a bite of a bagel, quick burn your th throat on a coffee and rush out because you, you snooze 17 times before you got out of bed. But when you choose to set aside 15 minutes and you say, hey, I'm just going to take some time to listen pause my heart, take a moment and be silent. The Bible talks about meditation, which is listening to God, meditating on something you've read. I heard someone say, read the Bible until something jumps out of you, then shut it. Because if you rush on to read something else before applying the first thing, you're in danger of having your heart hardened to what you needed to have changed. And, 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 and so, but, but that, that's great. But also on the days where you don't get anything out of it, don't be fooled by it. Don't be fooled if you don't get anything out of it because you're only perceiving that you did it. What you got out of it might be something you don't yet know you need, but God wanted to give to you before the difficulty came. So, so don't be tricked by that. You go a whole week with you don't get anything out of it. That's cool. I'm just going to get into a groove. I'm just going to get into a groove. I'm just going to listen to God. I'm just going to talk to God. I'm just going to worship God. I'm not going to be tricked by my feelings. My worship is not a, a, a feeling that produces acts. It's an act that at times produces feelings. You see? And, and, and know this, that if you don't worship God, you're missing on the chance to receive that day's mercies. 
Because Lamentations 3 says they're new every morning. They get reset every day. It's like a bakery that throws out its cookies at nighttime, right? So if you don't get that day's mercies, they're gone. Now, there's new mercies tomorrow, but you miss out on the chance to get that day's mercies. And who knows what you might have been able to do with that day's mercies. So come on, somebody. They don't roll over. Get them while they're hot each day. Get that day's mercies and tomorrow's mercies, because tomorrow you can't get yesterday's mercies. You can never go back in time and and be changed by God if you don't get it today. you got to keep it in the present tense. All right, so every day you start with God. I want you to seek my face early in the morning. See, come in the morning, because my mercies are new every morning. Every morning. You don't have to worry about me running out. I'm going to put out some fresh mercy in the morning. So soon as you get up, my mercies are just as new as your day is. And he said, come boldly to the throne of grace, that you might obtain mercy and find grace to help. Can I just tell you today that one of the most important things that we all need to do in our life is keep God first. Keeping God first is something that I think we have to work at and do on purpose. Because there's just too many things to crowd Him out. And let me just tell you something, if you're too busy for time with God, then you are just too busy with stuff that is really stealing your life, it's not adding to it. And most of you would probably say, without hesitation, that one of the heart, one of the most challenging things for you to do is to regularly spend quality time with God on a daily basis. When you get into a hard spot, when you get into a difficult place in your life, you need to start with God. Because otherwise, what will happen is hardship will come, and you'll think, where's the goodness of God? And you'll think, well, God's abandoned me. I'm trying to follow you, and this happens. I get laid off. I, this, I, this happens, I, and, and I, I'm trying to seek you, and we'll misunderstand that God always deposits his greatest treasures in the midst of what can be the, the most horrific circumstances. And, and here's what Proverbs says on that subject that just as a refiner's fire purifies gold and silver, God is seeking to purify hearts. And if we start with God when life gets difficult, we will not raise our hands and condemn Him with our fists of fury. We'll raise our hands up and surrender and worship Him. I'm telling you, in times of confusion, don't doubt God. Seek God. Call out to God in the day of trouble, and He will hear you, and He will help you. Don't just run to God when you have an emergency. To be honest, whether we know it or not, we're in an emergency mode all the time. I mean, if God doesn't help us every second of every day, I don't know what in the world would happen to us. And we need to realize that and pay more attention to Him. Listen, God is never more than one thought away. Never more than one thought away. If you want to experience God in your life, think about Him talk to him. You don't have to be in some certain posture or position to pray. Prayer is just talking to God. And I think a lot of times we over-spiritualize it and we make it something that it's not and it almost kills the pleasure of it. Develop the habit of having a continual conversation with the Lord. He may not always speak back to us in words, but many times when you're talking with the Lord, He will put a thought in your mind, and it may sound like your own voice, but that's one of the ways that God will speak back to us. I don't even really like to use this phrase because I don't do it for this reason, but I think it's the key to success in every area of your life. If you want to be successful, if you own a business and you want it to be a success, you better take the time before you get there to spend time with God. Life's full of difficult decisions and choices. You know, where do I live? And who do I marry? And about job offers you're going to take and what college you're going to go to and, and who you're going to do life with. These are huge things. And I'm, I'm saying that we should start with God, not end with God. So we start with God when making difficult decisions. One of my favorite verses in the book of Proverbs is uh, Proverbs 3, 4 through 7. Look at it in the Living Bible. It says, if you want favor with both God and man, and a reputation for good judgment and common sense, then trust the Lord completely. Don't ever trust yourself. Don't go with your gut, right? 
In everything you do, put God first, and He will direct you and crown your efforts with success. That's what we're after. Our efforts being crowned with success by God because we didn't consider what He thinks of any decision we make last. He's the first one we go to. We go to Him in prayer. We ask for godly counsel, and we consider that at the highest part of our list. Does that sound like it can move you towards where you want to be in life? Please make God first place in your life. Don't, don't pray for God to give you something, and then when He gives it to you, let that very thing that He gave you take you away from Him. And that happens so often, so often. Don't make the mistake of asking God to give you something, and then when you get it, let it take you away from God. A career you wanted, a ministry, a family. I know some of you maybe are young moms and you've got a house full of little kids and you think, are you crazy lady? <clears throat> I can barely get time to go to the bathroom, let alone spend time with God. Well, you know what? God knows what season you're in and I'm not giving you time frames on what you need to do, but I, you, you could at least start by saying, good morning, Lord, I need you today. <laughs> Amen. Because God understands where we're all at in our life. But I will say this, there is no person that's hearing my voice right now that cannot cut some quality time out of every day of your life to spend it with the Lord. Not one person, not one. Start with God, this is crucial. Jesus said it too, didn't he? Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Our problem is we go seeking after all the other things at the expense of the most important thing. But if we put the most important thing in the proper place, then every other thing will eventually fall where it should be as well. Let me tell you something, men and women, the incidents in our lives are not incidental. The trials in our lives are not trivial. God is up to something in your life and in mine. He is using our setbacks to advance our spiritual maturity to a place where we could never go without them. He's up to something with what's happening in your life and in mine. When all the tough things are going on in your life or in mine, we may not understand it, but we can know, we can know one thing, God is at work making all things work together for his good. God is good. God can be trusted. You may not know what he's doing, but he's doing something. Don't let the pleasure of the world, material things, or anything else get ahead of God. Proverbs 3, 6, the Living Bible. In everything you do, put God first, and he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. And we're all familiar with Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be added unto you. Don't seek what you want. Seek God and let him give you the desires of your heart. <laughs> Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the secret petitions and the desires of your heart. But we have to always strive, and I mean that in the right sense of the way, to keep God first in our lives. Because we all know, if we're honest, that there are so many things that can easily crowd him out and take the place that belongs only to him. I tell you right now, the devil hates us. And the Bible says we are not to give him a foothold in our lives, and we are not to open doors for him. And one of the quickest ways to open a door for the enemy is to know that you should put God first and let other things get ahead of that that are useless and meaningless. Now here again, this doesn't mean that you can't enjoy other things and have other interests, but God needs to be first. That means he needs to be first in our time, 
first in our conversation, first in our thoughts, first in our finances, first in every decision that we make. If you keep God first, you'll never find yourself in last place. You and I have the privilege of getting up every morning and spending time with the Lord. None of us know what tomorrow holds. And so how do we want to start tomorrow? How do we want to be sure? How do we want to be able to live peacefully, confidently, boldly, productively, fruitfully tomorrow? By starting off the day with the one who will give us guidance and direction, enable us in every single way. Well, what does he want for us? He wants you, just you alone. No iPhones, no telephones at all, no iPads and no computers and no this and no that, no the other, all the things that jam and crowd us. He, he just wants you. And let me just say this to you. Don't you think God deserves your undistracted, undistracted attention? And when I look at all the benefits of just solitude, just you and God, number one, it'll make your busy days much more fruitful. Busy, active days much more fruitful. Why? As you begin the day with Him, and you're listening to Him, and God is guiding you and leading you because you open your heart and mind to Him, and they're going to be more productive. Secondly, He repairs the damage. That is, let's say you've had one of those days and you come home and you think, I can't handle any more of this. And what happens? Time of solitude drains all of that out. And this idea of I can't and he won't, they will, no. Just give him time. It's like, it's like sometimes he squeezes it out of us. It's like sometimes he pulls the drain and it just pours out. And what happens is we're free and we're liberated. And that's the benefit of just being alone with Him. Listen, God's not uptight. There's not anything about us He can't fix. And He will fix it if we give Him time. So what it, is, it just refuels us emotionally. Listen to me carefully. He'll meet you anywhere you will to meet Him. A third thing is that solitude equips us to face the tough days. All of us are going to have them. All of us are going to have trials. All of us are going to have heartaches and burdens and things we have to deal with. And solitude, what it does, it equips us to face them confidently and assuredly without getting all nervous and upset and frantic and thinking, God, oh, what's going to happen? It'll make a difference in your health, make a difference in your relationships to other people. You're going to have a sense of peace and joy and confidence in your heart that no matter what comes your way, when you get along with Him, He steals your heart, quietens your spirit, and makes you an overcomer no matter what you're facing in life. There isn't anything else that can give me all of that but time alone with Him. And I would simply ask you this. Do you want God's best? This is the avenue. Do you want life's best? This is the avenue. Do you want peace in the midst of storms and quietness and joy when turmoil is all around you? This is, this is the answer. So every day we should start and kind of look over the day and say, Lord God, I'm going to be here today and here today and here today. And I pray for your strength to be the person of God I should be. Help me to bring the influence of Jesus into this situation. Or I'm headed to the doctor today. Lord, I don't know what the news is going to be, but I know you're sufficient and I pray for strength. You pray proactively. Don't pray after it happens. Pray before it happens. Amen? Really, it's important every morning. You should start the day off in peace, not stressed, hurried, rushing around. Look at the sunrise. Listen to the birds singing. Breathe in God's goodness. Thank Him for His blessings in your life. <laughs> Hebrews talks about entering into the rest of God. That means you have a problem but you're not losing sleep over it. You know God is still in control. This is one of the main ways we show God we're trusting Him by staying in peace. Not up when your circumstances are up, down when they're down. You're stable, you're consistent, 
you're in the rest of God. Jesus put it this way. Don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will have enough worries of its own. God has given you grace for today. You don't have grace for tomorrow. Don't try to figure out the next five years, play out all the what ifs. The what ifs will depress you. The truth is, if a what if does come to pass, God will give you the grace to handle it. What if the report's not good? What if my loved one doesn't make it? What if I do get laid off, Joel? Then the peace that passes understanding will be right there waiting for you. God promises he will arm you with strength for every battle. We may not know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. Now, don't miss today worried about tomorrow. Today is a gift. We can never get this day back. And sure, we should plan. We should use common sense. But at some point, you have to turn it over to God and say, God, you know what's best for me. You said you'd give me grace for every season. Just like you clothe the lily of the fields, just like you feed the birds of the air, I know you will take care of me. It's very freeing when you learn to turn things over to God. Where do your thoughts live? Where are you living? I'll tell you there's only three possibilities. You're either living in the past, you're living in the future, or you're living in the present. Jesus said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Think about it. The past exists only as mere memory. The future exists only in the imagination. Only the present exists in true reality. So why do we ruin the only moment of existence we have by pulling trouble from non-existent places like the past and the future? Here's what happens. When you borrow trouble from the future, now you've got double trouble. If you live in the past and you live in the future, you're allowing two thieves to rob your life. But if you live in the present, the Bible says that God is sufficient for every day. There's a wonderful verse in Deuteronomy 33, 25. Here's what it says. As your days, so shall your strength be. I love that verse. That means... Lord, I don't know what's going to happen on Wednesday or Thursday. I got this and that and all that. But all I know is this. For this day, I got the strength you want me to have. As my days, so shall my strength be. I live on that. I mean, I, I got so much stuff going on in my life right now. If I wanted to sit back and worry, I could be a professional worrier. But I chose not to do that. Here's what I've learned. I don't know how God's going to deal with tomorrow, but I know he's sufficient for today. And I'm going to rest in the promise that he has always kept. He's never, ever outpromised himself. Every single one of us can start the day off with prayer. Amen? You can. Now, you may not, but you can. Before you get out of bed, you ought to be talking to God. You don't know whether you're going to be able to get back in that bed again or not. Life is uncertain. And yet God is so certain. He wants prayer to be a priority in your life. The right time for prayer is not found, it is made. You gotta make up your mind. I'm gonna do this, this is a priority. People find time to do what they wanna do. If you're in love with someone, you'll find time to call them. And you won't be in a hurry to hang up. Morning is a good time to pray. Jesus, the Bible says, a great while before it was day, he rose up to pray. Nobody prayed like Jesus. Jesus sometimes spent the whole night in prayer. And you think, if anybody didn't need to pray, I mean, Jesus sort of had a hotline to heaven. Why would he need to pray? But he prayed like nobody ever prayed. As a matter of fact, the Bible says when the disciples saw Jesus pray, Luke 9, 29, he prayed and the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. So, start your day and say, Lord, Help me today through the Holy Spirit to abide in you, to keep you in my thoughts. Now, first of all, you know how much more peace it'll bring you? So many things you worry about, and you just think, Lord, take that away from me. Sometimes you got thoughts coming in your mind. You think, nobody should think those thoughts, let alone a Christian. Say, Lord, cleanse my mind, uh, or you'll 
see other people that you sense have a need and the Holy Spirit will nudge you and it's like you're in communion with God, the Spirit, with your mind. Don't you want that? Well, you're walking with God. You wake up in the morning and you ask the Lord to give you direction for your life uh, and to help you and strengthen you, to give you wisdom. And you think about this. Think about it in any given day, how many times you and I need to ask Him to give us direction and help us to strengthen us, to give us guidance, to provide something we need. That's what Paul means when he says, pray without ceasing. It's a way of life. It's a part of our daily life. We go to bed at night praying. We wake up praying. We are praying all during the day about different things that concern us. And when we wake up in the middle of the night, we ought to think about Him. Lord, is there something you want to say to me? Do you want to get me ready for something tomorrow that I'm not aware of? Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all of your plans to Him to be carried out or given up, as His providence will indicate. Thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God, and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. How are we transformed into the image of God? Through communion with Him. And Paul said to the Romans, listen to this, devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to prayer means you set aside time for it. You're serious about it. It is a priority in your life. Devote yourself to prayer. Give it an uninterrupted time. Think clearly about what you're talking to God about. Be serious about it. Not something you add on. You see, for most people, prayer is an add-on. It's, it's an add-on to doing this, doing that, doing that. And before I go to bed, I want a little quick prayer. No, you've got to give him time. You've got to have a relationship with him. And so when he says, devote yourself to prayer, devote yourself means you set us at a time. That is, the priority of prayer means I place importance on it. I place a position, it's first in my life, and prayer is the most important thing we do. Talking to God, the sovereign God of the universe, who has all power and all knowledge, who knows what you think and what you feel and what you're going to ask before you ask it. In the Christian life, there are three rules. You know what they are? Prayer prayer, prayer. It's the foundation of every blessing and all that we need. Prayer must be important. It's mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. So we ought to give attention to the things that God makes a priority of. Prayer is an expression of faith in God. Prayer is thanking God instead of complaining. Prayer is rejoicing, accepting, and appropriating grace into my life each and every day. One day we're going to see our Lord Jesus Christ face to face. And friend, we don't want Him to be a stranger when we see Him. Oh no. We want to be walking with Him in fellowship and in prayer, making a priority of prayer until we see Jesus Christ again. You see, Jesus begins by telling us men ought always to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 tells us pray without ceasing. And as we often have learned, when times are good, it's very easy for us to just forget to pray. Uh, we kind of start thinking we can handle it on our own. The truth is, He means to have our attention all the time, reoccurring Listen to this, reoccurring awareness of His presence and His power in our life daily throughout the day and throughout the waking hours of our life. But really the Bible says praying doesn't end. If you're a Christian and you're awake, you want to live in a constant walking relationship with God. That means that you spend your time abiding in the presence of God. You are praying always. Prayer is an attitude of life for the Christian. It is a way of life. Every blessing in the Christian life comes in connection with prayer. Prayer is not the exception for the Christian. It is the rule. No man or woman is going to be greater than their prayer life. No church is going to be greater than its prayer life. 
I wonder how many prayers that we've left behind because we quit too soon. We did not pray diligently. True, genuine prayer is a dialogue. Talking to Him, listening to Him, that's what God wants. He wants not only for you to talk to Him, He wants you to listen to Him. He wants to give you clear direction. He wants to answer your prayer. He wants to provide what you need. Most of the people who pray, they carry on a monologue with God. God hears my need, and they go on and on and on and on and talk to God. Watch this, and, and turn around and walk off, and they never listen to God. You know why? They don't expect Him to answer. Don't jump off, off your knees when you feel like I've run out of things to say. Linger and say, Lord, what am I forgetting? Is there something that I need to confess? Is there somebody I'm forgetting? So often our prayers are about us and our needs. Take some time to intercede for other people. And you'll find that prayer is not just talking. Prayer is communion where you're listening to God and He will begin to make impressions on your heart. Sometimes I've been praying, I thought, oh, my mind is wandering. And then I realized, no, God is reminding me of something I need to do today. God will speak to you when you're on your knees. He talks to you through His Spirit, through angels. He'll guide you. So don't be in a hurry. You know, the Bible says, do not make haste to leave the king's presence. Do not make haste to leave the king's presence. We don't have to beg and plead God to listen to us. He is hearing us. If you're a child of God, the ears of Almighty God are open to every single one of His children. You say, how could that possibly be because He's God? And because He's given us a message of hope about all of these things. So I think one of the reasons people don't pray is because, watch this carefully, they don't feel worthy. Uh, they don't feel like God's listening. They don't feel like they know how. They don't have the kind of relationship that would make them think that God would listen to them anyway. So their minds are full of doubt. I don't believe God will hear and answer my prayer because the truth is God does hear and answer the prayers of His children, even when we are confused, even sometimes when we think, well, Lord, I don't deserve it. The truth is none of us deserve His grace and love and mercy, but He's listening and willing to hear and answer our prayer. God, God is not in heaven trying to be secretive about things. He wants to talk to you about your life. Listen, He created you not to harm you, but to make it possible for you to live life at its very best. But in order for that to happen, I've got to be willing to listen to Him. And so we need to build a relationship with the Lord. So in order for that to happen, you say, well, how does God speak to me? Well, one of the ways He speaks to you is through His Word. That's why it's good to, to read the Word of God a little bit before you start praying. Not always, but at least at some point during the day, you read a portion because it's amazing how He can take you right to the Scripture that you just desperately need because He's God. And remember this, from Genesis to Revelation, <laughs> He knows every verse. <laughs> there isn't anything in the Bible He doesn't know about. And so, building that intimate relationship is absolutely essential. And that is my prayer, that you would do the most important thing you will do in your life every day and give God the time that He deserves. Listen, to do what? To set you up in a position to bless you the way He wants to bless you. To have you in the right place doing what He wants to do in your life giving you the very thing you're asking for but in the way He wants to do it. So you have to ask yourself the question, do I love Him enough? Do I care enough? Do I believe that He wants to do that in my life? We need to wake up conquering our day. We need to wake up defeating our day, not letting our day defeat us. Every day is for us to win. We're more than conquerors. We're called to win every day. Stop settling for half wins. Stop it. Stop settling for that. Listen, you have a choice every day to stay defeated or to get up and walk in victory. 
It's up to you. My victory is my responsibility. He said on the cross, it is finished. Greatest statement in the history of mankind. It's done. Now it's my job to accept it and apply it and start living in it. Listen, God came to give you life and life to the fullest. You either have a theology that Jesus wants you to be miserable, angry, mad, frustrated with life, miserable to be around, not, not happy with anybody, not happy in any season, or you believe that God came, you to get, came to give you life and life to the fullest. And sometimes I'm not saying that life's gonna be easy. I'm saying you have the choice to walk in victory no matter what's going on around you. Very many of us are facing our own battles. And when we look at them, our tendency is to get insecure when we're facing that difficulty in our marriage or in our finances or in our ministry or in our organizations in which we're involved or whatever it is that you may be facing in your life. It is our tendency to look at it and hang our head in discouragement because we feel overwhelmed just looking at it. But when you really understand what the enemy thinks about you, it changes the way you face your battles. You need to know that every time he sees a daughter or a son of the Most High, he is shaking in his boots because he really recognizes what your potential is. You need to know that even if you don't believe every single thing that the Word of God declares to be true about you, the enemy does. He knows, even if you don't believe it, that you have been forgiven. He knows that you have already been given the victory. He knows that you have been made competent by the Spirit of God. He knows that He is already under your feet. Listen to me. He knows that He can form a weapon against you, but He's very clear on the fact that it will never prosper. He understands and knows and believes every single thing that the Word of God declares to be true about you and about me. He knows that you have been given power and authority that he will never ever have access to. He knows that you have been made competent by the Spirit of God. What a shame it would be, y'all, for the enemy to believe more about our potential than we do. What a shame it would be for you and I to face our battles with insecurity and lack of courage because we don't even understand as clearly as the enemy of our soul does how potent and powerful we really are. So it doesn't mean that your troubles will change, your battles will change. It just means that the way you face it changes when you recognize that when God is for you, who can be against you? Could I tell you that maybe your victory is motion activated? Maybe the thing that you're waiting for God to do, God's saying, you got to rise up. You got to rise up on the inside and you got to do something on the outside. Do something that you think you cannot do. Overcome what the enemy has told you is impossible. Rise up in victory. It's time for you to start living the life that God's called you to live. John 10 verse 10 says, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. You know what the devil wants? The devil wants you to stay defeated, destroyed, struck down, thinking that it'll never turn around. But Jesus said, I came to give you life and life to the fullest. I've never yet woken up in the morning and had the enemy say to me, before you get up today, I want to remind you of all your good qualities. But if you're listening to the Lord, He'll tell you that. What God is doing is always greater than anything the devil is ever doing. I'm going to say that again. What God is doing is always greater than anything that the devil is doing. The devil's desire is for you to quit. The devil's goal is to get you to stop believing, stop trusting, stop worshiping, stop praising God, stop serving Jesus, stop walking with God, stop talking with God. The devil wants you. He doesn't even care if you're saved. He just wants you to shut up and be quiet and live in darkness and be depressed and give up and quit on your harvest, quit on your family, quit on your loved ones, quit on yourself. The devil's a quitter. And he wants you to be a quitter, too. So what he tries to do is paint a hopeless, dark picture of your life so that you will be discouraged, so that you will feel lonely and so that you will feel depressed. The truth is, is that Jesus destroyed the works of the devil, but we lose sight of that at times because we can't see beyond what's right in front of us at times. We can't see beyond our anxiety. We can't see beyond our loneliness. We can't see beyond our fear. We can't see beyond that. Those moments of depression, those feelings of darkness. Your enemy, Satan, wants you to be transfixed on the bad times. 
and let the bad times eat up the good times. But here's the great thing. When Jesus steps into your life, he's the good thing. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. And suddenly he stops the bad. And wherever bad has happened, please listen to me. Where, where, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Where failure abounds, forgiveness much more abounds. Don't let the enemy get you to maximize the bad and minimize the good. God is for you and God is with you and God is going to help you. Don't let the bad destroy the good in your life. Find the good and focus on it. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. You have a choice of what to look at. What are you going to set your mind on today? Good things that are going to lift you up and build you up are things that are going to make you sad and depressed and discouraged and tear you down. The more you focus, whatever you focus on is what becomes the biggest thing in your life. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There are bad things, but they're not stronger than good things because everything that God has is greater than anything the enemy has to offer. So if we focus on the godly things and the good things and the positive things, they're going to drown out and swallow up the bad things in life. Weeping may last for the night, but as joy comes in the morning, it's time to move forward. You've cried long enough about this defeat. Just because you lost the game doesn't make you a loser. Just because you had one mistake doesn't make you a failure. Failure is not final. Rise up and move forward. Psalm 42, David said, why am I discouraged? Why is my soul downcast? Why am I letting depression ruin my days? If I only get one life, and if the average lifespan in this, in this current season is 75 to 80 years, why am I wasting my years, my days, constantly depressed, discouraged, miserable, making everyone else around me feel miserable? David said, I'm gonna put my hope back in the Lord. I'm gonna put my trust back in God. See, victory begins when you surrender to Jesus. I can't have victory over my situation until I let Jesus have victory over my attitude, until I let Jesus have victory over my heart. It's time to wave your white flag to God and say, I'm tired of fighting this on my own. I'm tired of pushing you away from me. Lord, I surrender. Have the victory over my life. When God gets the victory over you, God will give you the victory over that situation. You know how you win the battle, my friend? You begin that battle on your knees and you face the battle from a stance of victory to make a choice that even though the circumstance has not changed, that you are gonna thank God in advance for the victory that you're anticipating him to give. It's on your Monday mornings and your Tuesday afternoons and your Wednesday on the job and your Thursday running errands and your Friday out with your friends and your Saturdays. It is in the regular rhythms of our everyday life, in the face of our battles, when we choose to get down on our knees and stretch our hands up high and say, thank you, Lord, in advance for the victory that I know that you are going to grant me. I mean, you are looking at the problem. Your marriage is still a disaster. Your child is still living in a way that is not a congruent with the way that you raised them. You're still having a hard time with your boss on your job. When you are still looking at the problem, but you choose to worship your great God, it is an affront to the enemy. It lets him know that you are still, your allegiance is still firmly planted to God. When you worship God, you roll out the red carpet. That's what worship does. It rolls out the red carpet for God himself to descend and march into your circumstances. And the enemy knows that. That's why he wants you to do everything except begin the battle on your knees. I don't want to waste another day of my life. Because I walked through depression, man. I stood on a bridge. I had suicidal thoughts. And you know what? It's not God's will for us to live like that. 
for anyone in the room who's like, I just don't buy this theology of good news. What theology are you buying then? Because the Bible says this is the good news. Something good is going to happen to you because Jesus lives inside you. And guess what? Satan doesn't like it. So he's going to bring something bad against you. And what are you going to do? You're going to shake it off and you're going to keep walking in victory. You're going to keep moving forward. This is why Paul said, I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. Yeah, I'm perplexed. I am perplexed. Life's unfair. But listen, I might be persecuted, but I'm getting through this. I'm moving forward. I'm convinced that I can live in these light momentary troubles. They do not compare to the glory that is awaiting us. And I know he's working all things together for good. And I'm more than a conqueror. And if God is for me, who can be against me? So I'm putting my faith not in myself. Jesus gives us the victory, not our personality, not our connections, not our talents, not our strengths, not what people think about us, but what God says about us. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're children of the King. We have the victory through Jesus Christ who lives in us. Your temporary setback is not a permanent vision for your life. Don't let a temporary season of loss or pain become the permanent uh, uh, attitude you carry, the permanent vision you have for your life. You can keep looking in your past, but as long as you look in your past, you'll never see your future. You can't step into the future victory that God has for you if you're holding on to a past defeat. Just because you had one loss doesn't mean you're a loser. Just because you missed it one time, just because you dropped the ball doesn't mean that God will never hand the ball back to you again. God has a future for you. The enemy wants to keep you in a shoulda, coulda, woulda place. You see, sometimes we identify with what we're going through rather than identifying with who we are in the midst of it. You're going through some tough stuff. You're going through some tough times, but like the like one of the preachers said years ago, tough times never last, but tough people do. Life happens, stuff happens, but you have to decide yet in all these things, Paul says, I can add up everything that's ever been done against me and everything that's against me now. Yet in all these things, I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me. Sometimes we're having our own little pity party because life didn't go the way we thought it was going to go didn't get the promotion and your best friend did. You, you didn't win the thing that you wanted to win. You didn't get the house that you wanted to get. Things haven't turned around yet. You were counting on something to happen by the age of 30. It didn't happen. And now you're trying to figure out like, when is that going to happen? Has God forgot about me? And you're laying on the ground. God's saying, get up, get up. There's still victory in front of you. You haven't preached your best sermon. You haven't sang your best song. You haven't seen your greatest miracle. Stop acting like your life is over just because it didn't go the way you planned. How many people have stopped short of the victory that God has for them? Because of the pain they've walked through, the divorce, they got let go of a company, someone left them, the doctors gave them the report and said, this is your final vision for your life. No, 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 it's just a temporary setback. You could change that thing. You can change what's going on in your life. You have the power to respond with victory. You don't have to respond with defeats. Like if you've lost someone and you think their prayer up in heaven is, I just pray that they stay miserable, angry, mad, depressed, lonely, frustrated, pushing everybody away from them, mad at God, mad at life. That's not their prayer. They're cheering you on from heaven saying, don't you throw in the towel. I need you to finish in victory, dad. I need you to finish in victory, mom. You weren't born to live in misery. You were born to live in victory. Like the living for Jesus is not meant to be burdensome, frustrating, angry, discouraging. God called you to live in victory. Second Corinthians says he leads us into triumphant victory. He leads us from glory to glory, from strength to strength. He wants us to be an aroma of victory wherever we go.